Welcome to this week's video. I'm going to start off by dismounting a piece of U between centres. This is about 12, maybe 13 inches long. Uh, I did put a faceplate on first, but it didn't line up properly, so back to um, centres. And as you can see, it's turning reasonably truly. Um, so once I've got it on um, between centres, I just need to make a chucking point. So I'm doing that at the tailstock end here, just clearing off a bit of loose bark. And I'm using a half inch bowl gouge if you're in the UK, or a 5 8 if you're in the USA. Anyway, same tool, um, as you can see, just using a pulling cut just to clear off some of that bark and get down to solid wood and then I can get a tenon turned on there. Uh, it's going to be a 100mm tenon or 4 inches with a little dovetail on it as well and going into Axminster's Mega Jaws. Right, so I've got it now held in the chuck at this end, live centre at this end and now it's about putting some kind of shape on it, establishing a bottom where I can make a foot eventually and then seeing how this little hollow works out. I'm imagining something flaring as it goes up, but we'll have to see what's under all this bark and all these lovely knots that are sticking out of it. Now I'm just going to start down this end, working in short sections to begin with while I see what's under there. And uh, I've got a full face shield on which is essential for this kind of wood with lots of loose bark things that could go flying. So I'm actually going to stand down this end and pull cut rather than be standing in front of it where it could throw itself into my face. Okay so here we are starting down at the bottom um, you can see the gouge bouncing around a bit it's still quite out of round and there are dips and voids in it um, but here's a closer shot of what's happening I'm leaving uh, a foot at the bottom you'll also see that's acting as something to stop me putting my chisel all the way into the chuck not a good idea any time of day oh so just using the pull cuts just to get a rough shape and then I'll come and finish it um, with something finer a little later on so you can start to see the foot's uh, pretty much established now so I can move a bit further up the log and uh, you can see the shape starting to take take shape <laughs> right going to come up to the very top now reposition the camera a bit and onto the top end <coughs> again using um, a pull cut um, and here you can see the whole log and the shape is beginning to become clear it's a very simple shape I didn't really want to put anything complicated in here because I think the wood speaks for itself uh, but if there's one thing I love about you it is the variety of color and texture and shape and swirl and pattern within it it really uh, is a very attractive wood to work maybe uh, a little bit too much sap left but I didn't want to make it too thin and here, slightly finer cut, you can see the gouge is not bouncing around nearly as much now. Um, and uh, the shape is just about there. The uh, next stage, of course, will be uh, hollowing and doing some drilling to get that made a little bit easier. Okay, happier with that. So now I've got to come down and pay some attention to this area. Right, just tidying up the shape, a little bit blurry, sorry about the out of focus shot there. And now getting the foot a little bit more refined, just thinning it down a little. It was a little bit chunky. And so just putting uh, a bit of a more pleasing shape there. And then the transition between the foot and the base of the vase. Another thing I've got to watch out for is not to make this too narrow because I want to hollow it. So. I think that's probably it, and just a little bit of torn grain there, and then I think we're ready for some sanding on the outside. 
So a smaller gouge to here. <coughs> this is Les Thorne's signature spindle gouge. Just a little bit more finesse with that tool. So that cleaned up that torn grain. <coughs> and I decided to put the sanding off for a while. So uh, here we are, drilling out with a one inch force and a bit in a Jacob's chuck in the tail stock, just to get me started with the hollowing. Now, uh, the hollowing tool I mostly used is the Proform uh, from Woodcut. <coughs> it removes wood brilliantly. And it's um, held in a, uh, comes with a metal handle with quite a bit of weight on it, but I was getting so deep eventually with the hollowing of this that I had to add another handle. So I added a Simon Hope long handle with the red collet chuck, and that fitted perfectly onto the end of the woodcut handle. You can make your own wooden extension handle to go on. As you can see here, I'm probably about four inches in. In the end, it ended up at least 11 inches deep. And for every inch over the tool rest, uh, the formula, I'm told, is four inches behind it. So you'll see in one of the shots later on how long the tool actually ended up being. Once I got the first half um, hollowed, I was able to put uh, the force a bit back in, put it in an extension so that I could drill down to the bottom to the final depth and then um, continue hollowing. <clears throat> now, I'm still a beginner hollower, I would have to say. I was pleased with the results of this, um, but I have got Simon Hope's hollowing rig to have a go with, so I'm looking forward to playing around with that sometime soon. air in the middle of it where the hole has appeared in the side. Oh this is the sweat of a man who's been hollowing by hand to an incredible depth of 232 millimeters. enormous. <clears throat> there you can see the, the whole tool, tool, the tall tool. Um, I think it came to something about four and a half feet tall. Um, <clears throat> and down the bottom there, it was a bit tricky. Uh, I won't lie, uh, it did take a bit of sanding to get a, a decent, uh, decent finish in there. And the outside certainly is a lot smoother than the inside. The bouncing around inside was quite hard to control. And there are, a, it's a little bit, not ridgy, but gently undulating. Not unlike the South Downs at the back of my house. Right, there you go, a shot inside. So not noticeable to the eye, the ridges. These are the moments I treasure in my shed, weirdo. Yeah, get back to work. Power sanding. Never underestimate the usefulness of a random orbit sander. I actually use this sander quite often it's on platters as well, uh, much quicker than using my drill or sometimes an inertia sander and just to see what it's going to be like here's some oil going on i'm using hard wax oil all in all i'd probably use three coats um, not to give a great big glossy shine to it but to give some a bit of a sheen uh, make it a little bit um, more pleasing to the eye and it does enhance and bring out the grain nicely so i need to finish up that um, rather messy foot at the bottom so going in with a parting tool, and that's really just to give me the bottom of the foot clear so I can trim that using a little spindle gouge. And I decided it was still a little bit too thick, so I went in again. Right, so sanding, finishing off that um, transition point, and obviously that would be re-oiled again, and then using the parting tool to go in and part off. Now I am not going to part this all the way off and catch it as it comes off the lathe. I'm going to take it to a sensible depth with the parting tool and then I'm going to use a saw um, to, to remove it and then I've got much better chance of catching it and not having it flying off and getting a nasty ding and a dent in it. 
So here it comes. Right, so it's been cut off uh, from the tenon, left a rather jagged bottom, which of course I need to get rid of. I could sand it, but um, I think it always looks better to have a turned bottom. So I'm gonna make a bit of a jam chuck out of it, bit of sweet chestnut, which I'll put some packaging around as well, some, some router mat, and then I can jam this gently up against it and, uh, and turn the bottom. So with the advantage of two lathes, I can move on to my other lathe and get the jam chuck put into a, a chuck with seed jaws on, a bit of router mat, and there we go, get the vase on. Now the eagle-eyed will have spotted that I didn't leave a centre mark in the base, which was a bit of an error, but it didn't seem to cause too many problems but it is always good practice to mark the center of your pieces before you um, get them chucked up. So I'll try and remember that next time. And then always a little nerve wracking bit, how many little more nibbles do you take at that cone that's left? And that's the only thing keeping it held between centers. Did I do one too many? Not this time. Some eyes on. I'm using hard wax oil. Now I've probably said several times already that I've left this with splits in. You will probably split some more. I've had that happen. And in fact, I've had it happen where it's split and then after a few days it's closed up again. I put that down to my magic powers. And here we go, my um, U-Vars. Uh, <coughs> I've kept it really rather rustic for me and uh, I think I like it all the more for that. Beautiful colour, beautiful figure in the wood. It's had a coat of oil, but it'll have several more. I want to, I want it to be have a sheen rather than a shine. Um, you know, the last thing I want to put on this is anything that makes it look plasticky. But uh, another two, maybe three coats of oil. The foot has got splits in it. It's got little dings which are there from from the log. So it's as natural as possible. I've kept the top exactly as it was from the sawn log. Um, dangerously thin there. Hmm, musical as well. I, I like the hole in it. I love the knots in it. And uh, all in all, it was great fun to uh, hollow all the way into that by hand. I suppose, I suppose we ought to see how deep it goes. Right down to the bottom and up to the highest point on the rim is about 280 millimeters or 11 inches in proper money. Right, I hope the close-ups are making it look even wowier. That word is just for you, Noel. And um, until next time, as I usually say, thanks for watching. Oh, love a bit of ebonising lacquer.